Should you take your hard earned money and invest it into Chinese stocks? For many people, the immediate answer is no. However, sometimes some of the greatest opportunities in investing come when there is fear in the market. The best example for this came in March 2020, when COVID-19 caused a tremendous decline in stock markets around the world. However, if you've been actively investing these past 18 months, you have been able to experience a tremendous recovery and most likely have made some incredible returns. However, some US stock market analysts like Jim Cramer say Chinese stocks are not a safe place to invest your money. However, we have to look at both sides of the story. On November 24th, American billionaire fund manager Ray Dalio raised 1.25 billion US dollars for his firm's largest China fund yet. Mr. Dalio believes that exposure to China is essential for diversifying one's portfolio. Now, in today's episode of Real Talk China, I'm excited to welcome in an expert on Chinese stocks. This is Marcel Munch. He is a German entrepreneur who runs a popular YouTube channel, Dongxi, that is dedicated to analyzing some of the biggest Chinese stocks and stories from China. Is investing in China actually safe? Is there a risk that Chinese stocks will be deregulated from the US markets? What about the political drama between the United States and China? Does this cause more risk to investors? We're going to be answering all of these questions and more in today's episode of Real Talk China. Before we get started with today's action-packed episode, I want to give a huge thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. Now, I've been using a virtual private network for many years now, and I do think that this is an essential tool that everybody around the world should be using to keep their data protected and safe. Surfshark VPN believes in me, believes in the goals of this channel, and again, they are offering an amazing Black Friday sale. What I want you to do is use my discount code Cyrus at checkout. That's going to give you 83% off. In addition, because it's Black Friday, they're going to throw in an additional four months of service just for free. And I want everybody to realize that this is a no risk offer because they offer you a 30 day money back guarantee. You literally cannot lose with this deal. If you're in the market for a VPN, make sure you give Surfshark VPN a try. And let's jump into today's action packed episode of Real Talk China. Everybody, I want to welcome into the studio and to Real Talk China, Marcel Munch, who is coming live from, uh, from, uh, from Berlin right now. Is that correct, Marcel? That's correct. <laughs> yeah, Marcel, welcome to Real Talk China. How are you today? I'm, I'm pretty good. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, it's awesome to be here on the channel and um, looking forward to chat about Chinese stocks and the stock market. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Marcel, I, I really love that we're able to connect here because, you know, over the last year, we've seen a lot of uh, news about Chinese stocks. You know, we've seen mm -hmm. a lot of stocks that have uh, gained a lot of value quickly. We've seen, you know, certainly the Chinese government be involved in Chinese stocks. We've seen a lot of valuations come down. And I wanted to bring in, I really like to bring in experts and people that know a lot more than me. I think that's what really helps build this channel is bringing in some of the best experts on China. And I'm really excited to get some of your insights into this, but I want to start off at the beginning. Let's start mm -hmm. off a little, learn a little bit more about you, your journey in China. I know that you and your partner, you run a great website called Dongxi. Um, mm -hmm. You have a great YouTube channel as well. We're going to put the links down in the description for everybody. But let's start back at the very beginning. Marcel, what got you interested in China in the very beginning? Yeah, it's, it's quite a funny story, actually. So um, I didn't have too many touch points with China in the very beginning. Um, so I actually uh, signed up with a, a study course called Chinese and Business Administration in Germany. And that was really just by chance. So I was looking through all of the programs uh, that mm -hmm. were open to enroll. And I found this one course, uh, which obviously also already had Chinese in the name. And at that point in time, I never have been to China. I didn't know how to say the words Ni Hao or anything, right? Yeah. So, But I had like a pretty good travel experience and I was always looking for uh, broaden my horizon to find something new. And I, I guess what really uh, triggered me also was that back then already in the media, there was lots uh, of talking around China in terms of its economic power, Correct. all of the, uh, the headlines around the yellow danger and stuff like right. that. And, uh, but personally, uh, maybe what got me also into China in, 
yeah, in, in a way, was <laughs> watching a couple of Jackie Chan movies in the very beginning. And so nice, <laughs> uh, nice. you know, those two things, they came together and I was like, okay, let's try that. And uh, I, I wrote it. Yeah. Marcel, a quick question. When, when was this time frame? When were you starting? When, when, when was that this? It must have been around 2006. Okay, perfect. And, and that's very similar to my journey. I started really getting into China 2006 and I moved to China mm -hmm. in 2007. So I think very similar timeline. Yeah, well, um, enrolling in this program, I had to uh, learn Chinese at the university. So the program was set up in a way that we had to read, write and speak Chinese uh, until we got some uh, a certain understanding. And then it was also part of the curriculum to actually move to China. But um, oh, you beautiful. get actually to China and at the ground where you can already um, express yourself in Chinese. So that was quite helpful. That's amazing. And, um, yeah, I, I guess my first time in China was around 2008, must have been around this. And uh, quickly after also, of course, uh, moved to China. Um, I was uh, working uh, later on in, in Shanghai, uh, in Beijing, uh, at, at the German Chamber of Commerce in the oh. environmental department. And um, after that, of course, you know it as well, um, always been connected to China. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Especially, I think it's really important for expats that, that go to China, that were in China during that time, because that was a really pivotal time for China's growth. Uh, you know, I really see that as the golden age where China really showcased itself to the world. Of course, in 2008, we know Beijing hosted the uh, the Summer mm -hmm. Olympics, and that was a, a marquee event for China. And, and again, that was kind of China saying to the world, you know, we're here on the international stage, we're hosting the Olympics, you know, this is really going to be a big period of growth. Uh, you know, I was in Shanghai in 2010, which we hosted the World Expo mm -hmm. six month uh, event there that really showcased uh, Shanghai and, you know, really developed that city. And again, I think these two events part of a very big growth, you know, you know, that we were able to see in China. And, and I, I know, for example, any expat that I talked to that was in China during those days, we're very grateful to see that robust growth period. You know, it was really a fun time to be in, in Shanghai and Beijing and China in general. Exactly. I think it's a very vibrant, uh, vibrant community back then, uh, like most of people like us yeah, really interested in yeah, these foreign opportunities in a way and then uh, like a similar mindset I would say so absolutely so you you really started learning Chinese when you were in Germany right through this program so exactly. like you like you said by the time you hit the ground in China mm -hmm. you're already able to read and speak and certainly communicate at a, at a pretty effective level yeah, yeah. Although you know that Chinese is pretty hard. <laughs> it is. Oh, it is. And it's also different, I think, when you're learning in a university setting and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're on the streets in Shanghai and Beijing. I mean, you'll hear the different accents, you'll hear the slang, you know, and you have to get a feel for that. So it is so important. And I think this is also important when we start analyzing China. It, it is so important to go there and spend time there because, you know, if you don't have that experience, again, you could learn you could learn Chinese for two years in the university, speak it at a good level, but until you get there on the ground and really speak it with the locals, it, you know, that's when you can take your Chinese to the next level. Yes, yeah. 100%. And uh, it really only started to um, open up my mind in terms of understanding the culture and the, the, the people even better after also learning Chinese uh, in, sh in Shanghai back then. Uh, so yeah. with the with the basis, the foundation that I already had, but that really was like a, 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 a catalyst even back then again. Fantastic. Now let's, let's switch to really the area that you are most knowledgeable about, I feel, and that's really Chinese stocks. You know, what, mm -hmm. what got you interested in Chinese stocks? Yeah, it's interesting because you introduced me as an expert for Chinese stocks, but actually it's all kind of self-taught in a way. Yeah. And it, uh, it really happened because, well, later on my, my start in my career was actually to become a consultant for mainly European companies um, mm -hmm. that uh, back then started to learn around the startup scene in the US, so Silicon Valley, and they yeah. learned around all of those emerging business models. Well, of course, Google, Facebook, and you name them, right? And Correct. Uh, the German companies, you may know, are a little bit more laid back and traditional in many ways. We have like a different setup. And so lots of these bigger corporates actually needed some consulting advice and help in order to um, innovate, to to get uh, to make new business models viable and find uh, new markets. That's where I uh, initially started my career. And as I mentioned, okay. oftentimes we were looking to the US for inspiration, for exciting use cases and to learn about companies and the new uh, business engines there. But uh, with my background, having lived in China and understanding and always following China as well, I knew some pretty exciting cases in China. This influenced not only my work back then as a consultant, but later on, 
I really um, started to dig through those companies, uh, through the business models, and also not only on, a, on an artificial or superficial level, but also like into the numbers and what makes the innovation with Chinese characteristics. And this is actually kind of where my self-taught knowledge about all of this uh, was coming from. So it's partly based, of course, having the feet on the ground in China, but then also partly through this kind of analytical professional work that I'm doing. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I think that's uh, definitely a good strength of, of many Germans is the very analytical and, you know, <laughs> looking at the details and everything. I've, I've got a question. You know, I think for a lot of people, uh, Chinese stocks is somewhat a little bit overwhelming. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in this in, in the sense that it's very difficult sometimes to get a lot of information. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I'm, I'm an American and I invest actively in the U.S. stock market. And as a result, you know, whatever company you're interested in, let's let's say Starbucks, for example, there's mm -hmm. really a plethora of information that you can find uh, online and you can really find. Let's say if you're interested in investing in Starbucks, there's a lot of things that you can read. I think some people kind of struggle with that with the Chinese companies. There's not a, as much information. So can you uh, explain to us like a little bit more into how you do your research, you know, and how you uh, mm -hmm. were able to find some of this information. Like when you said you're analyzing some of these business models, you know, how do you do, go about doing that? Well, there are some, you know, interesting kind of technology websites um, similar to what we know in the West, where, which okay. are reporting about what's going on in the startup scene and uh, in the technology field. And they, yeah. these are some good go-to websites actually to okay. get some inspiration. And then of course, when I'm doing um, back then uh, professional work, for instance, doing interviews with companies or you know, looking into the user research part. So actually yeah. speaking with people on the ground, this gave me insights on where uh, the next consumer trend are emerging and what kind of companies are doing things. And so I know this doesn't sound very feasible for the um, actual retail investor maybe based right. in, in the US, but actually um, over a time, there are now more and more websites accessible that are having this kind of information in English. But of course, this doesn't really help um, somebody who's not knowledgeable about China and how things work there to Correct. really make sense of it and uh, well, kind of uh, judge whether or not this business model actually has legs or how it can work in, in China and maybe even global. And so that's actually also what I try to do on my channel, I'm trying yeah. to get the information out there, trying to um, really tell more about these companies, because um, it's quite interesting. There's many Chinese companies listed at uh, US stock exchanges, right? That's so, right. Um, yeah, actually, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's really easy to invest uh, in, in them, actually, if you wanted to. Correct. But these companies are really bad at telling their story, unlike the American companies. So right. they, they have no history and no legacy and no um, yeah, experience in actually telling the world what do they do and uh, what's the vision for this and what are, frankly, the prospects of this company? And then also, of course, what's the invest case of this company? For sure. And I think that's what you've done a very good job with your YouTube channel. If you go to Marcel's YouTube channel, Dongxi, you can see really a great breakdown of, of many Chinese stocks and you do a great job analyzing this. And I think that's you brought up a really good point that you have to have some good knowledge into how China works and how the systems, the culture, the language, this all does play a very big part in that and, and mm. why it's it's not as easy just to look at it. Um, you know, for example, let's let's we're going to bring up some uh, specific Chinese companies now. Uh, let's talk about Alibaba. And, and I know this is one of the most popular Chinese stocks. And sometimes people in the West, this is what I feel many times we look at Alibaba and we simply say it's the Amazon of China. But mm -hmm. I think there's there's a lot more to Alibaba than that. It, I don't think that's a fair equivalent. So tell us a little bit more about your thoughts about, say, Alibaba, one of the popular Chinese stocks. Yeah, I would say like that the broader picture and context for the real big Chinese tech companies like Alibaba, like Tencent, like Baidu right now is of course the crackdown. So this is kind of also, well, the internet the tech crackdown with all of the new policies and regulations. And I think this is also once again where Alibaba is kind of at, well, yeah, really at the focus, like on the headlines. Yeah. And so this is mainly what we possibly see also in the Western media. But exactly like you say, there is not a very big understanding of the company, what it is doing, like what are the different prospects and business models and revenue streams and potentials of this company. I have actually been 
active in the area of cross-border e-commerce before. So that I have like first-hand knowledge of doing actual yeah. business with Alibaba. And therefore, I know the huge um, importance it, it's having as an impact on the lives in, in China. You know, every, every Chinese citizen is actually a kind of uh, already a user of, of the Alibaba ecosystem sure. in a way. And it, it spans through so many levels and many things are actually happening in the back end, like, uh, for instance, the, the, the logistics part, the cloud activities, nowadays blockchain technology, all of these areas where Alibaba, because of its size, is playing actually a major role of shaping uh, what is happening in, in China on, on the technology development. So it's right. a really uh, exciting and interesting company, in my views. Mm -hmm. um, although the topic whether or not this is a good investment case is a, 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 an entirely different point. Uh, Correct. You have issues like with around you know, its leadership, Jack Ma, and uh, yeah, the, the end financial IPO, which is, of course, also part of the Alibaba group and, and things like this. So this is a very, very complex company to analyze, in my point of view. I, I agree. And I think one of the, the one of the points that you hit there and kind of what I want everybody to understand is that if we just look at Alibaba, say, as the Amazon of, of China, that is one small component of it. I mean, it is a large component mm -hmm. of it, but it is one part. And there is so many different things when we talk about Alipay, we talk about the blockchain, the cloud services. And, and really, I think the key point you said there, Marcel, is that Alibaba, it really touches the lives of every Chinese person. And it really is on the forefront of how the future of China will be operating. And this is why China's government, you know, has come down with these regulations, because I think what mm. you see as compared to the West, for example, if we look at Facebook, you know, Facebook is largely unregulated in America. You know, we've seen, for example, in recent weeks, you know, the whistleblower has come out, there's mm. been a lot of controversies with these tech companies, and they're almost a little bit too big in America and to the point where the government can't control them. And that is a complete opposite of what we see in China, where obviously, you know, there's no company that is above the government, the government will be able to regulate. And I think that is actually a benefit in some ways, because for example, with the ant IPO, um, I had another guest on the show, Richard Turin, and we really broke down why did Chinese regulators come in and stop that ant IPO? Mm. Many people said, Oh, you know, this is China trying to destroy capitalism, they're trying to destroy entrepreneurship. And that's not true at all. But th they saw was is that this could potentially expose China to severe debt and a lot of risk that the government was not wanting to take. And so they said, no, let's take a step back. This is a very big IPO that's going to affect the lives of hundreds of millions of Chinese. You know, we'd rather cancel the IPO. Let's maybe break the company up, do it a little bit more organized, and that will set us up for more long-term success. And I think that's where, if you probably agree, I think that's where sometimes we see a very big difference in culture. Because and again, in tech, tech is largely unregulated in America. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas in China, you know, it's going to be regulated because it plays such a pivotal role in the future of Chinese people's lives and the future of the Chinese economy and, and livelihood. Yeah, I fully agree with your take. The thing is, in China, you always need context and probably most people don't have it. So yeah. let's take the example of e-commerce. Um, yeah. You probably know that in the past, there was this big split between the monopolies, uh, Tencent and Alibaba, where mm -hmm. uh, if a, a shopper would check out or find an advertisement on WeChat, um, he could not go jump over to the Alibaba ecosystem in order That's to right. check out the card. So this is actually not good for the consumer and ultimately also not the economy. And actually, these are some of the new rules now implemented that are kind of opening up this system. And so, well, I don't want to spoil it too much, but I think we could actually end up at a case where in the future, we will have the coin termed of uh, China becoming an innovator in terms of the regulation part. Um, not to say that each of these regulations are good, uh, inherently. Um, of yeah. course, the markets didn't like them mostly, yeah. but my personal take is that mostly those have been uh, perceived uh, not as well because of there is no understanding of how China works and there is not much insight into how these companies work. And that, of course, creates fear and misunderstanding. And I frankly view it as a double standard in a way, as you have mentioned, that yeah. uh, we have similar things happening in the West, um, not only in, in Germany, but of course also in the US. Yeah, no, I think it's a 
a, I think it's a very good point. And a, again, this is why it takes a lot of, um, you, you need to have that experience. You need to seek out some other voices. And I think you're one of those great voices. I really enjoy the work that you do on your YouTube channel, you know, providing us those extra insights. Because, you know, a, again, if anybody's interested in investing in stocks and trying to understand China, you're going to need to do more research and you need to connect with people that have that experience, certainly been on the ground and have these insights into these Chinese companies. Um, let's talk about, um, I want to talk about the electric vehicle space, because mm -hmm. that that is uh, something that we really see China, you know, really innovating, you know, cr mm -hmm. tr creating a tremendous amount of companies that, you know, and, and, and it's quite incredible because, uh, for example, I know in Shenzhen, they have 16,000 electric buses, you know, that mm -hmm. now power, you know, Shenzhen. Uh, mm -hmm. China is the world leader in renewable energy, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, and we're seeing a great revolution of EV vehicles in China. For example, the license plate, you know, that you're able to get, yeah. it, let's say it's in Shanghai or Beijing, very expensive. And I believe, you know, you, you get, um, you know, a free license plate if it is an electric vehicle. And so there's, there's very big incentives for people to be purchasing EV. And, you know, obviously China has committed to becoming carbon neutral by 2060. This plays a large role. Let's start off with probably the, one of the most famous ones, NIO, which is a mm -hmm. very big, you know, EV play. Um, and then let's share any other companies that you think, uh, you know, I want to just get your insights into the Chinese EV space. Sure. So um, I think you made a good point here with um, how China is really playing the long game here. And um, I, I mentioned in the beginning that I worked at the German Chamber of Commerce in Beijing. And back then I worked yeah. in the environmental department. That was 2010. And I saw all of the legislation put in place for renewables and uh, like also the first pilot project for um, electric cars, like namely BYD back yeah. then. And I was looking at these companies not knowing what was about to happen because it really took quite some time and frankly also an American player Tesla to open up the market right. aggressively because Correct. otherwise it possibly wouldn't have happened. But we also need to note clearly that uh, China is not now jumping only on the bandwagon of things um, but clearly always had the goal to kind of uh, leapfrogging technology here uh, which they always do like with the, the mobile phone just skipping the normal PC area and in terms of the combustion engine they also knew that they couldn't compete with yeah, our German car industry right right and so um yeah it was really uh, strategically set in place uh, all of it the legislation like the license plates that you've mentioned and um, that's why i think we now see also um, some of the most important ev players emerging in china and this is why i personally also started covering the company new more in specifically and started investing actually when this company was at, frankly at the verge of bankruptcy yeah um, but um with my own eyes and also running back then at that point in time many consulting projects actually also in the automotive field, I saw immediately that this company is going to have a, a bright future in my point of view, uh, because um, this is in my point of view also a very unique new type of Chinese business, not copying like, uh, yeah, usually that's kind of the, the stereotype you have about Chinese companies, right? Correct. But it's unique from the design, unique from the technology, from the business model. And what also really matters um, as a first premium to luxury brand in China as a Chinese player, which is quite um, yeah, unique unique, also having a very high quality in terms of the cars that they produce. So this is changing everything in my point of view. Yeah, I, th I think you've brought in a really good point, because if we go back in time to our very early days in China, I know in 2007, 2008, uh, you know, if you had enough money to afford it, you know, you were going to buy a Mercedes or a, mm -hmm. or a BMW or a Volkswagen. I mean, you know, these German German products in China, uh, very similar to Japanese products, everyone kind of stereotypes it saying this is obviously very high quality. And, you know, German automobiles, of course, are very high quality. And I think what we've seen is a very big shift. And, you know, 2008, I don't think the market was really ready for a high-end luxury Chinese automobile. You know, many, many Chinese would have always looked to say, well, I want to have, you know, the more expensive international brand. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, I knew a lot of... Um, uh, people that worked for Mercedes, for example, in Shanghai, and mm -hmm. they just had amazing sales, you know, from that period, 2007 to 2012. I mean, they were very dominant in the market. But I think we've seen that shift. And and obviously, there's there's also, like you mentioned before, there's a stereotype where, you know, the Chinese are always copying. Um, yeah. But we've seen a shift where Chinese now, the companies, the people are becoming the innovators. And exactly. going back to what you said before, I think we will see China as an opportunity to be an innovator when it comes to tech regulation. That's 
-hmm. going to take a few years to kind of see how that pans out for China. I think Neo is a great example where it said, no, we're a domestic high-end luxury product that, and people now have shifted their mindset saying, you know, I want to buy the Chinese as well, because I'm proud of the quality that we can produce domestically. And I think yeah. that's, a, that's a big thing that we've seen. Exactly. So they have introduced a couple of new things. So first of all, the quality standards, I mean, it's like driving an Audi or a BMW, frankly, but yeah. of course, um, that uh, is still uh, something well that's not enough just for a Chinese brand to succeed but then you might know this as well they have always those kind of Chinese characteristics so in, a, in a terms of Neo they have this battery swapping technology which they introduce yes. which basically um, gives you a wholly new uh, charged fully charged battery instead of slowly or uh, fast uh, supercharging which can take still up to 40 minutes and they right. can swap the battery in just uh, three to five minutes so this is kind of solving some of those pain points that today's electric drivers are still uh, facing in terms of the charging and waiting times. And um, NIO went with this technology. Um, they haven't innovated it, but they made it uh, the first success case uh, on uh, on the market, um, introducing it to the market uh, here in, in China first. And of course, here the question is now whether or not this can succeed overseas. Correct. But um, second of all, you may also know the, the very high service level and standards and experiences in China. China. So wherever you go, walk through into a mall or like a hairdresser or something like that, you always have a very high uh, level of service, right? And Neo is also um, using similar tactics here in order to generate a, a better, a more customer-centric user experience, which frankly, um, the normal car manufacturers aren't giving anymore, right? And so that's right. making them unique. And uh, on top of that, also incorporating uh, something called Neo Life, which is a, a lifestyle experience, uh, which has to do with consumption upgrades. So buying and, and consuming products that are high quality, that are good for your body and, and, and things like that, which um, makes makes it really um, yeah interesting here because this is not only a car company anymore. Yeah. Um, they are touching into several points here, into renewables, into um, batteries, into EVs, but also here on the e-commerce and a retail side, which is quite interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's really good. Thank you for those insights into Neo. I mean, it's it's been interesting to see, again, this progression and I think what's also really important as we look at China is just that we're not used to this in the West is China speed, you know, mm -hmm. how fast things can change incredibly in China and how fast that everything's moving. I, I was doing some research into the EV market uh, around the world, and it was mm -hmm. quite fascinating to see, for example, in China, the amount of slow charging uh, mm -hmm. EV stations and fast charging EV stations, um, you know, China dominates as far as the worldwide percentage, you know, mm -hmm. it's something like 80 and 90%, you know, are already in China. So, mm -hmm. So, you know, they're building the ecosystem. And I think if we fast forward, you know, another 5, 10, 15 years, you know, what is that car market going to look like in China? It's going to be dominant with electronic vehicles. And I think that's going to, and, and so as a result, you're going to see more companies coming in. You're going to see more innovation and companies like Neo saying, look, we can't just produce an electric vehicle. We have to think of, we need higher service. We need to think mm -hmm. of lifestyle. We need to think exactly. of being the innovator. And I think that is where China is shifting forward. So that's, that's some very good insights, Marcel. Thank you for that. Yeah, exactly. So basically, I'm always saying like maybe a, a few years down the line, Neo could land in some of our uh, MBA business classes as a case study, as kind of the first Chinese brand, uh, which also has has this kind of success, hopefully overseas, because right. frankly, Neo, um, well, they, they've been pretty smart around their branding and the logo yeah. and the name and stuff like that. But I think I have the feeling that this one could really resonate also with Western consumers, of course, it will always be tougher as a Chinese brand. But, um, you know, I, I, I frankly see a shift here for uh, from producing for China and, you know, selling Western brands into China to innovated in China and possibly innovated for the world in on an entirely different scale. Well, I think uh, I'm going to draw a comparison with um, one of the one of the electronic manufacturer, uh, Hisense, which mm -hmm. has, you know, been a big uh, sponsor of, for example, the Euro Cup, the UEFA Euro Cup. Uh, they were a, a, a key sponsor of that event. And I know that they have been involved in, 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 in these major football tournaments, you know, with FIFA World Cup, the UEFA, uh, you know, Euro Cup. And I remember seeing the case study on them and how much they had, you know, they, for example, I believe the first one was in 2018, they sponsored the FIFA World Cup in Russia. But they said, look, you know, we're producing a very high end television, and we want to export that around the world. You know, we don't want to just do that only for the Chinese domestic community. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and, and here in Canada, for example, we've seen, you know, the, the growth of that presence, my, my wife and I, you know, have purchased one as a result. And mm -hmm. it's a it's a great price point. It's a fantastic quality. 
quality product. And I've talked to many people here that say, yeah, I mean, it's 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 essentially it's a little bit cheaper, but a, a higher quality, you know, so it's, it's a great product. And I think you're going to be able to see that with Chinese companies, because that is the next market is, you know, we're already doing well domestically, but how do we take it to the next level and make sure that because we're now an innovator, let's make sure we can take these technologies around the world. And I think at the end of the day, I mean, if you're in the market for a TV, what do you really care? You want a good price and good quality. So if the Chinese brands are delivering that, you know, and the reviews are coming in, you're going to give that brand a, an opportunity. Yeah, no, totally. And I also would say like that the key to um, Chinese companies becoming increasingly um, innovative here are the consumers who are very demanding and actually also really keen to trying out new things. Plus, yeah. On top of that, there's lots of competition. I think you had this great show around uh, whether or not China is still um, capitalist after all of these crackdowns. And I think yeah. uh, people really need to understand like how Chinese innovation happens. It's not kind of destroyed by those kind of um, regulations usually, but right. there is a, an incredible in entrepreneurial mindset. Whenever there's a new opportunity, there is somewhere a door opening up and then there's like 10 companies or 100 companies going in there Absolutely. and trying to, to catch this business opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think you can agree, you know, m even from a cultural perspective, you know, the Chinese are so good. They, I, I see, I find so many Chinese have a, have a side hustle. You know, they really <laughs> love the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, I'm, one of my favorite stories is I, I had a colleague that would travel and she used to buy shampoo, um, mm -hmm. you know, from, from different countries. And I think she had a connection with Japan. And anyway, she started a, you know, an Alibaba shop and she was, you know, she started making 20, 30,000 renminbi a month, you know, selling shampoos from Japan. And that was just her side hustle. And then it became her, her, her full-time job and I, and I and I love that I mean we've seen this and how the internet has enabled a new generation of entrepreneurs that's really all over the world but the Chinese love that as well and I think that's an important point that you need to that you've just made is that entrepreneurial spirit and, and the the key to innovating let's let's talk about um, a little bit more about Chinese stocks and I think some people that are watching this episode um, you know they might be asking you know should I have some Chinese stocks in my investment portfolio you know if you're if you're dealing with somebody that says Marcel I know you know a lot about Chinese stocks you know, what percentage should I have in my portfolio? Do you think it's important for people to, you know, own Chinese stocks in, in an investment portfolio? Well, first of all, what I'm also saying always on the channel is I cannot give investment advice, uh, first yeah. of all, because I'm, well, from my background that I just explained, I'm not a financial advisor, nor do I know uh, the financial situation of um, my target group that is watching the, the videos. However, right. um, the channel is also called the China Opportunity because I frankly mm. think um, there is lots of opportunity and potential in um, most of these stocks that are kind of not well understood. And so in general, um, there is always, of course, the question whether or not you should invest in, in Chinese stocks or not, if it will yield enough of returns, whether or not it's even ethical and stuff like that. But right. what I would always say is um, invest into the future that you believe in and into something that you understand and that you like. And nice. I think this is possibly also why, for example, the big names like Alibaba, or Neo are doing quite well because they have uh, well a bit a, a little bit more of coverage on uh, the Western media. When it comes down to the financial side, I think um, right now with all of the, the correction in Chinese names, um, it's quite interesting. But these are actually the times where you would like to put in some money. Usually, um, that's the, the 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 hard thing about investing when yes. everyone screams "get out of it" and when the fear is high. Um, that is usually when you get the gains over time because um, well, you are invested in the long run. Turns out from the stock market perspective, you're usually doing quite fine if you can hold on to something over time and maybe invest from time to time instead of just trying to time the market and say, you know, right. this is the bottom and now I'm going to get 10% return. That usually doesn't work so well. And Correct. right now we are in a historic situation where in, in the beginning of the 2000s, uh, it was that uh, the performance of the US markets and the Chinese markets has been as bad as now. So that gives you kind of a mm. historical um, low value of Chinese names. And uh, in my point of view, oftentimes this is an opportunity because frankly, you kind of want to have some exposure even in a in a diversification type of um, uh, idea 
to um, yeah, be exposed to Chinese names, just to have the balance here because it's a global world. And of course, China is playing a very major part in this world. And um, usually we could also be quite optimistic about the prospects of the Chinese economy. Although, of course, there is lots of talk of how bad China might be doing in the short term. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I, I think you've brought in a very good perspective. And that's just, you know, good investment advice. You know, obviously, a um, great example would be March 2020, you know, when all yeah. of the financial markets were, were, were trending down. And, and that was really a, a time where many people started to sell and panic. But if you were smart, you know, you're seeing these great companies I mean, even like Apple and Starbucks and Disney, they were slashed in half um, in a couple of weeks and nothing really changed in the business models. I mean, you know that these companies, for example, are very, very valuable. They're, they have a tremendous cash flow that they produce. Mm -hmm. They're going to recover. And we saw smart investors were actually accumulating shares at that time and, you know, experienced a great boom in return. You know, many people had their highest returns in 2020 and also in this year as well. So I, th I think it does, you know, um, provide a good perspective. And, you, and I like your insights there as far as timing the market as well, right? If, if it's down a little bit, you know, mm. it's better to allocate over time, you know, you know, that dollar cost averaging, as we say, in investing and, and looking at that. Um, what about regulation? Do, you, do mm. you have any fear that potentially these Chinese stocks could be delisted from the US market? Yeah, that's a very good point. And I mean, this kind of um, plays into the FUD, sort of fear, uncertainty and doubt around uh, Chinese names in general. And this is also part of the deal why Chinese names are usually valued um, lower than their uh, US counterparts. So for Correct. example, you have a, 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 an American company which is doing like 1 billion in revenues, that type of company, if it's a, so a software company would usually trade around 10 billion valuation. So a 10x of their current revenues right. for a Chinese name sometimes this can be just only one X. And the, the reason for that oh. is that, uh, frankly, sometimes uh, people just don't know about what this Chinese company is doing and how well this will play out in the future. But second of all, what you also mentioned, like the regulation and the fear around the legal setup, like um, right. there is this um, the VIE structure, but also the fear of uh, Chinese companies may be delisted from US exchanges. So we have now this holding foreign company uh, companies accountable act um, which have, I think uh, was initiated by uh, during the Trump administration. Yeah. And I think lots of people were actually thinking uh, by the time the Biden administration takes over uh, that the Biden administration may have a, a more friendly approach towards China uh, in many ways and uh, that this uh, regulation would uh, kind of um, not be pursued any further. But the contrary is the case and it seems like this regulation um, is still set in place. And so Chinese companies could be challenged with uh, the, the real threat that they might be um, delisted from US exchanges. Now, what I always tell my viewers is that buying um, shares in a company constitutes ownership. So it doesn't mean that your ownership in a company is taken away. Those Correct. companies can also list somewhere else. So yeah. for example, Tencent is even not listed on US exchanges and this company is big and doing quite well. There are ways of listing in Hong Kong or in the future also in Shenzhen, in uh, Beijing and uh, other stock exchanges. Um, the Chinese are actually trying to kind of replicate uh, the financial power here in terms of also of, um, coming up with their own exchanges. And um, right. yeah, this could be ways where also those shares could trade in the future and also be accessible for investors. However, I would personally say so that hopefully... U.S. and China can come to a, a deal when it comes to this um, delisting bill. And yeah. I think it's also in the interest, frankly, the U.S. Um, yeah, finance industry. Um, we, we see basically also what's happening during this um, tax sell-off. The major financial institutions are actually investing in China. There is more and more Correct. foreign um, uh, investment coming into China. Right. All of the major institutions like uh, Morgan Stanley and so on, they are now getting and acquiring national licenses in China in order to participate. Possibly in the future, Chinese um, um, stocks are rather listed in China and accessible. And so I think there are some signs that, that they will actually come to terms because there are actually trillions in in, in stocks traded uh, of Chinese names 
on U.S. exchanges, where I think Wall Street will possibly not miss out on these opportunities. And that's really a, the, the same stem, uh, viewpoint that I have: is that the you know the U.S. financial markets they they really ideally you know you want to have Chinese companies as part of that because you know the United States market is the biggest in the world. It's it's where many companies you know ideally everyone has that dream to list in the New York Stock Exchange. You know, there's over hundreds of companies from China that are already on, like you said, trillions of dollars in value that is already present there. I do think it would be great though, for example. There's been some proposals that you know, look, if you're a foreign company, you need to have some certain accounting requirements that match up with the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission. And I would be, you know, perfectly happy with that. I think that's great. I mean, we should certainly have. If you're going to list in the U.S., you need to go under the U.S. regulations. So I think if there's a maybe a tightening of the processes, mm-hmm. the procedures, yeah. I think that would be very good. Uh, it could also give some more investor assurance and just a little bit more uh, better feeling about investing in these Chinese companies. But ultimately, I don't think Wall Street and, like you said, these major institutions that are pouring money back into China, that are expanding their investment, the foreign capital investment into China. Uh, you know, we realize this, and I've seen this, the most successful people in the world, you know, the most successful businessmen, they realize how important China is to the world economy, even to the United States economy, and obviously building a bridge and, and you know, formulating a better relationship would be key. Yeah, I really agree on this take um, in terms of also, we need to be fair and, out, uh, and really also say that Chinese uh, companies could be more transparent about uh, um, not only the books, but also I mentioned before, like the, the investor story. And yeah. I think they are still in a process of learning. And this is maybe also here the, the opportunity there that they may come to terms, find an agreement uh, in the way that there is some sort of oversight, uh, which is not regarded as a state secret by China anymore. And um, Correct. Uh, th- those companies are able to uh, get uh, give more transparency. And that could actually even lift the valuations of these companies uh, in an enormous way, in my point of view, because uh, then what I've mentioned before, this um, difference between how U.S. companies are valued and Chinese companies um, could actually become a little bit more closer in the end. And uh, But another point here, which I'd like to make is that usually you have also this uh, stereotype that uh, Chinese companies are cheating and uh, they are oftentimes fraud. And this is why policies are getting into place, because you can't trust Chinese books. And of course, there is some truth to it. Like I've even covered it on my channel, like Luck and Coffee. And frankly, yeah. I was even invested in this company. But mm-hmm. also from my from my um, personal experience of investing uh, in not only Chinese companies, um, there is an issue around if a company is um, yeah really um, yeah, giving the true numbers or not is not related to whether or not it's a Chinese company or a U.S. Under, company. So we have similar fraud in in other yeah like Enron or um, uh, Nikola Motors, and you know these are U.S. companies or a Wirecard in in Germany. It happens. Yeah, everywhere. I, just, I just thought about Wirecard as well. Very big story that just came out last year for for Wirecard, huge uh, fraud. And I think you're, you've hit it right on there. Is that there is a stereotype that Chinese uh, companies are cooking the books and you know potentially misleading but we we do see that across the board every i mean this is uh when we talk about greed and you know faulty accounting that's that's uh that's a human element so every human you know it comes down to individual people that you know decided to take advantage of uh, of, of a situation but ultimately it always fails but i think i think you've brought in some good points there and, and one of the main points i want to say is that the only way that we're going to improve this is through more dialogue and i think this exactly. is why it's just so important to have you know for example when the united states if a senator comes out and say we need to ban chinese students we need to ban chinese apps we need to ban the Chinese from listing onto our stock market. You know, this is not how this is actually also hurting America in the in the end. Whereas we need to say, look, let's have a better dialogue. Let's come mm-hmm. to a better conclusion. And for example, you know, if you're going to list in America, maybe you need to do, you know, A, B and C. And we need to have a little bit more regulation, a little bit more procedures. And if that would be a lot more fair. And I think that would help more people understand more about China. Chinese could understand how to market their product better to international investors. Mm-hmm. And I think, for example, you know, Angela Merkel, Deutschland, you know, Germany has done a very good job in with dialogue in China, mm. I think really leading the European Union in that obviously, um, you know, President Xi um, had a great chat with Angela Merkel, you know, which which I believe was about last month, probably the last time that those two leaders will communicate with each other. But mm. they said, you know, they really thanked each other for keeping an open mind, building that good relationship between Germany and China. And again, I think this is what we always see if there's an issue with China, you know, we don't want to retract. We actually need to engage more because that is how we're going to solve these differences. 100% agree on that. And I think this is also where the stock markets can play a, a good role, actually. So 
Um, for instance, uh, retail investors into Chinese stocks, like American investors, if they can participate on the coming growth story of China as well, yeah. I mean, that will, um, you know, make them richer as well. And this is uh, the Absolutely. way how you um, kind of ease and tame those kind of conflicts. Uh, and so, um, yes, th that's also why I would say dialogue and education and learning uh, and bringing those two worlds together is really at the core also what I'm personally doing here with the channel. I love it. I love it. Marcel, I have one final question. I ask every guest on Real Talk China. What is one thing you want the world to know about China? Uh, good question. Yeah. Um, well, I would say there's lots of understa misunderstanding, actually, when we talk about China with mm -hmm. all of the media images that we have, which are usually quite negative, right? And also... Yeah. Because simply they have obviously a different economic system and usually we align that to the, the Communist Party and a, a different um, a way China is being ruled. And what I think what really opened up my mind and what I would like people go out there and research and maybe watch some of your clips, but also others uh, on the net is to learn more about um, yeah in, in, in their early stages of the, or sorry, the late stages of the Qing dynasty and Ming dynasty when, when there was also all of this imperialism going on in China by uh, the Western countries. I think this is really what has shaped a lot of the views of Chinese citizen about their role in the West and also mm -hmm. makes uh, a lot of the fundament of, uh, you know, what has happened afterwards with the founding of the Republic and so on. And also it plays so much into those different understandings between the West and the East. And so if people would research that more and learn more about it, I think there would also be a better understanding like where this, this kind of different mindset is coming from. And frankly, I didn't knew it before learning about it either. And um, that's because we always have this centralistic mindsets around Europe uh, or in your case, North America, right? And so um, that I think is crucial to learn to um, yeah, of many of the ongoing conflicts today. And so this is something which I think everybody should um, yeah, look into. Fantastic. Marcelo, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you as a guest here on, on Real Talk China. And for everybody watching this, I'm going to put down in the description uh, links to Marcel, uh, his cha YouTube channel, also his website that you can connect with him. Marcel, thank you for everything. Thanks for having me. It was awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Take care, everybody. And we'll see you all in the next episode.